My name is Andy Jones and I'm from Radio Film up in Newcastle and it's quite honestly been a, a privilege this year to work with the South African delegation, the biggest we've had for years at Sheffield. And we've got 20 filmmakers, producers, directors, commissioning editors from South Africa and this is their session. I just wanted to say at the beginning that straight after the session we have South African drinks on the Curzon rooftop so they've obviously brought the right weather for that. And for those who are still up for things Africa-related after that, over at Abbeydale Picture House, there's a screening of a film called Tanzania Transit with food and DJs and even Swahili bingo. So that's the rest of your day sorted. If you'd like to stick with us, we can guarantee you a good time. And for now, someone else to guarantee you a good time, I'm sure, our chair for the session, Pat Van Heerden. Well done. Um, just for everyone on your chairs, are all the films that the filmmakers have here, please read them, spread the word, put money into their films. Here are the South African initiatives that are going on. Please read them and come. Um, and also the DFA, uh, which is the Documentary Filmmakers Association in South Africa, is hosting the session. We've organized and has paid for the Department of Trade and Industry, which is a South African uh, financial support for us. And Desmond is here. He's the chair of the, the DFA. Desmond. If anyone wants to know anything more about the DFA, he's in the room. And the other board members and DFA delegates. Um, so welcome, and it's very nice that we have m many other people besides Africans in the room, which is fantastic. It's nice not to be always speaking to ourselves. OK, um, we wanted to start with uh, filmmakers are finding less and less funding available for documentaries, particularly in the development phase. Its producers and directors are self-financing the beginning phase, and they carry all the risks. In Europe, the public broadcasters, an old and trusted funding source, is finding less money to fund documentaries. And this is partly because of the focus on uh, budgets for wars and immigration and security. And that's almost the same li line item with the same um, amount of funding, and that gets media gets taken away. So documentaries don't have that much funding anymore. And in fact, it's a crisis in Europe for documentary filmmakers. And in the context of a kind of vigorous nationalism moving from Eastern Europe across Europe, USA, the UK, there's a focal, focus on local and a lack of international um, commissioning. Elsewhere on big SVOD program, um, platforms and other networks, what you're seeing is commissioning through algorithms, algorithms of financial gain, rather than on meaning and content. This is not something, so the, the end of it is that documentary funding is shrinking. Um, the other thing that it's not just in this part of the world, it's in Africa too. In South Africa, many of our slots have, for the, that was on the public broadcast are no longer there, and funding is shrinking. Obviously, we can find various ways to support it, but the end of the result is that producers and directors are self-financing documentaries. So that's part of the discussion we're having today, is to look at how people are doing this, how are they self-financing projects, and what new technologies and new audiences can we find, and how do we access these audiences? So firstly, the panel. Um, we're going to start with Rita. Rita, who is right next to me, is a multi-talented individual who straddles the world of music and documentary. She's a musician, DJ, promoter, curator, and now a TV presenter producer. After a career spanning four decades in the music industry, Rita has turned her hand to presenting a documentary format series as the face of Africa, a journey into music. So welcome, Rita. Thank you. And then uh, Molatello, who's right next to me on this side, Manenche from South Africa. Molatello is the founder of Storytelling First Hand Filmmaking Project in rural Komajaji, where she trains young people to use film to tell their own stories. She recently completed a really moving personal debut feature documentary, When Babies Don't Come. Um, Enver Samuel is a very interesting dude over there. Who He runs well, he cycles well. He was born <laughs> because he was born in South Africa. He works on social impact documentaries, but he also works in various capacities as a teacher and a content director on big budget reality shows, including Survivor. 
He is here with a film, Why Dulcie September, an investigative film about a covered up political murder. Last but key in our discussion is Tulanana. She's the co-founder of Una Stories, a mobile first storytelling hub pioneering VR and mobile video in Tanzania. She has been on TED talking about mobile technology and how it's changing the way content is created and shared on the African continent. Tilanana recently left her post as Swahili editor for the BBC World Service in Dar es Salaam to focus on Una stories, creating all digital, all African mobile first content. So a very, very eclectic panel, and we look forward to hearing from all of them. And we're going to start with Rita. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Ah, so um, part of the theme for today was uh, new voices, new devices. And as I can never follow a script, it's an old lag, and she's toting around a record player. And this record player that um, I'm toting uh, around was uh, for the uh, documentary that I've been um, so lucky to be part of. It's a three-part documentary on African music, and we just don't get to see what's happening um, musically in Africa uh, just now. So I, I absolutely jumped at the chance. And um, how do you start to even encapsulate the wide spectrum of music, the richness of African music? And that, that, that was our big, um, big, big headache. But in the end, we thought, OK, we've only got enough money to do we, well, actually, we didn't have enough money to do three countries. Everybody who was involved, and I was so lucky to be part of this great team, which was um, women-led. And um, everybody kind of did it for minimal. In fact, we would have done it, done it for nothing. But don't tell the people who paid for it. So, uh, so anyway, we decided to... Um, you know, squeeze in three countries, and it was a squeeze, um, and it, it was on a shoestring. So we went to Nigeria because of the rhythms and how those rhythms have kind of informed popular music. Um, if you think what's happening now in the dance halls and everything, it's Afro beats coming out of there. And then, of course, there's harmonies, so where else are you gonna go but South Africa? And um, then, the ancient melodies and instruments of Mali. And Mali is probably the country that most people who are into what is called world music, and I hate that term, um, that's probably the uh, country they first think of, and with good reason. So um, we got the gig, and we. this idea of taking the record player wasn't mine. It was um, uh, one of our directors, and it was a genius idea because a lot of the artists that I spoke to when we got there hadn't heard their music on, on vinyl, on record. Um, and if they had, it was right back in the day, you know, uh, in the hopeful times. So it was a great icebreaker. Um, it, it took them back and it kind of opened them, opened them um, up. And uh, some of these people, I've been doing interviews until it comes out of their ears. So it, I think it just provided um, a little space for us to actually, you know, be, have a more intimate uh, uh, conversation. Now, and then with the younger uh, people that I spoke to and the record player kind of it was almost like a back to the future because where vinyl just went out of style and everything was CD and then from CD it was downloads, well, vinyl's back. So it was quite exciting for them, you know, listening to old records or listening to new records on this platform. And then uh, the other geniusness for me um, of uh, our one of our directors, Claire, um, suggesting record players that right now it's 
the crate diggers, I call them, the people who are going back to the 70s and, and 60s and, um, and 80s and digging up some absolute gems from around the world. And um, it's grown and revitalized vinyl. So it was for, for that reason, really, that um, we took it. So. Um, one of the, um, I think what we'll show you a clip um, uh, and then um, I can talk to you a little bit more. Now, um, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not South African, but we did go to South Africa, like I said. And um, I got to talk to a wonderful musician called Tandizwa Mazwai, who is the, uh, for me, the bridge between uh, South Africa's rich, cultural uh, mu musical heritage and um, and what's happening now. She is like the go-to person for young experimentalists. And then the older generation, your Dorothy Masukas, who, you know, she she was on par with Marion McCabe. Um, she reckons Tandis was the one who is um, carrying on their musical uh, legacy. So, um, Hello, yes, could we have this little clip? Um. And I think that's probably my eight minutes, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Thank so it's using um, old technologies to get to new audiences. Yeah. In a sense, broken. Thank you. Um, Moving on to Molotello, um, we're going to talk about the various hats that you have to put on in order to make um, your passion for a documentary film came, come to realization. How do you fund, how do you fund yourself? Yeah, um, I mean, you, uh, you correctly pointed out earlier that budgets are shrinking, um, especially for documentaries worldwide. So, but then what do you do when you are in a situation where you have a story and not just story, but stories, and you don't have the money. You have two options, which um, the first one that I did when I, I actually had three more films that I did uh, for broadcasters before um, in South Africa, and um, the current one that I was is actually my first feature, um, currently screening as I speak in South Africa, When Babies Don't Come, it's a project that actually I had to, I used that project to um, put to practice um, what I'm gonna talk about now. The fact that when you realize that you have the story that you're dying to tell, but you don't have the money, you don't have um, resources in terms of human resources to bring on board, what do you do? So I then decided I will I'll, I'll wear many hats um, and become this hyphenated filmmaker, um, which of course I learned from, um, from the film school that I went to. Um, and I, I saw that working quite well, um, because then for the, it's a film, the film, I made it over 10 years, over a period of 10 years. The first good seven years, I had no funding whatsoever. Um, you go into one to the film fund, National Film Fund, and they turn you down, and you try to knock on doors, and no one's responding. And you, then you sit down and say, "What do I do?" So you have a camera. You know, at some point, it's my own story, by the way. You have to turn the camera against yourself and just keep shooting, keep filming, because the story doesn't wait. So only on the seventh year, you get the National Film Fund coming on board. And then once they give you, they gave me the note, then I just had more funders coming on board. So basically, what I'm, I, I'm, what I'm, I'm, I'm referring to now is that when a story comes, you're a filmmaker, you can't just sit and say, because I'm a producer, I can't do anything. So that's what I have done. I'm going to ask uh, if you can play uh, When Babies Don't Come trailer just to take you through the journey that I, 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 I embarked on, and then I can talk over that afterwards. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, as you can see from the clip that you watched, you, you start with me with my dreadlocks, very quite short, to show that it was many years ago. 
Um, but then um, what I am saying is that um, we have the technology. We don't have all the money in the world. When a story like that came to me, the first instinct was, I want to tell this story. But no one was willing to give me money. But then I had a camera. So that's the, the product that you, you see on the screen today. OK, thank you. Did you? Sorry. <laughs> sorry, we'll go to questions afterwards. Um, so uh, then we'll go up to Enver. Enver um, wears many hats, some of them big time reality shows and then other important films. So over to Enver. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I think I'll start off with uh, the Survivor clip. So uh, the reality shows allow me to pay for that. And it doesn't make me popular with the wife because it's every overseas holiday keeps getting postponed because I put all the money into that. <laughs> but um, that's the sort of situation in South Africa that we face is that the money for documentaries is not readily there. So I'm forced to, to work in that. I straddle those two hats. I, I'm a reality director. Keep that quiet. But um, that's my passion. So, I mean, are there, is there anyone else in the audience? Big reality format shows and documentary? No. Oh, you're all alone in this one. <laughs> so I'm a big anomaly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing that for the past five or six years, and um, I, it seems to work. Um, I'm able to, to get the freedom to, to work on my passion projects. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not ideal because, like I said, I mean, I, the money always gets, gets caught up in, in passion project. But um, the good news is that uh, I recently just landed um, 15,000 pounds for that uh, from, uh, is that me echoing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, fifteen thousand pounds and um, and a twenty thousand euro offer from a French producer to come on board. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess uh, yeah, I'm, I'll take questions if there's anything else. But but yeah, so so survivor over four hundred crew, two hundred South African, two hundred Filipinos, and going to three th uh, three man crew on the documentary. So. It's quite a big, you know, it's different fields, different, yeah. Um, okay. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so let's move on to Tulanana, who's going to be, um, well, we're all more aged on this side. <laughs> so she's going to speak from a more, uh, reaching a youth audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'll just start with a little the clip. Um, So that just um, um, is a little bit about uh, a little of my journey, really. I, I've just left a very stable job um, very, with a very big, big people to pursue what has been my passion in the last three years, um, doing the same job for the BBC. Um, I came from a radio, then TV, and then digital media kind of background. And um, and now I'm doing virtual reality and 360 videos, and trying to introduce that and translate that into Swahili for people to understand what I'm doing has kind of been <laughs> a, a journey and, and very interesting. But really, um, digital media for me, or um, at least made for mobile content, um, comes from my experience just seeing that young people are no longer, you know, I don't know, I don't know anybody in my in my age group or my group of friends that owns a television um, and that will purposely buy a television anymore um, unless it's to play video games, literally unless it's to play video games, but not to watch satellite TV um, or, or, or cable news or anything like that, everything they get from their phone. Um, 
Um, I was uh, as, a, as a digital editor for the Swahili service. A lot of the stuff we'd put on our website, especially the videos and things like that, um, would not get, no one would go to the site directly. Everybody would go through a social media site. So if you've not posted it on Facebook, then you just know it's not, it's not going to get any sort of audience engagement or anything like that. And so um, we've been engaging as owner stories in the company is in, in trying to find out, one, what's the infrastructure around creating video for mobile? Um, uh, what are the kind of like, um, not, not the technicali just not just the technicality sides, but really um, in the is if in the documentary space going to um, a to get a commissioner, you know, to get a uh, commission from a fund or whatever, who would be that equivalent for mobile, you know? Uh, would it be the tele telecommunication companies or I, and how would they present that? Would they present in special bundles that you could get and uh, things like that? So, you know, um, yeah, that's that's kind of like where where we are at. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just play a little bit of video just uh, to speak to that as well. Yeah, so don't we all have that problem of uh, my mobility on 2% right now? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, I should be Instagramming this. Um, no, so really, um, our, as you know, as Honor Stories, our main focus has been, you know, Africa first, mobile first, video first. And the, there is data and growing data and research into why that should be so and how we should be turning our eyes to this, this, this as a platform and to make platform specific content. Um, and, you know, uh, we've spoken a little bit about, you know, um, repurposing content. You know, a lot of TV station broadcasters, whatever, you know, they, they have so much in the archives of content that they then just go and just dump on their, like, sites or whatever. But they could repurpose that and optimize that for, for the mobile audience. But what about going out and making new content um, with, with mobile in mind? Um, you know, already we see that in the journalism sort of space. Um, now more journalists are learning how to, you know, shoot, edit, do everything from their mobile phone, especially on the continent, uh, rather than going through the whole new course of ha learning how to do all of those things um, with, you know, bigger cameras and bigger equipment. Um, so, yeah, a, a key thing there, like, in, in that video is to look at what, and what we're looking at is, you know, it, the mobile is data and local content hungry. So, you know, that when I when we say that, we can see that, especially what I've seen is that you go onto the YouTubes, you go onto uh, whatever platform, and I can easily get a, a bunch of documentaries and a, a bunch of like uh, deep dive, uh, sort of Vox like, Vice like documentaries um, on issues to do with Europe and to do the Western world. And, um, there's none of that in, in, you know, for for my audience, and so we were like, let's let's get into that space and see what we can create. Um, again, self-funded most of the time, but now more increasingly in the last like two years, we've been able to partner with, uh, with organizations that are interested and in, like realizing that this is a platform that uh, they cannot ignore anymore if they want to really reach the growing audience and the, that are more majority youth um, um, in Tanzania and in Africa at large. Yeah. So I'm going to start start with you. Oh. Um, I mean, one of the what, what we know is that there's a huge huge youth bulge in Africa. We've mm -hmm. got that's our audience. That's where we should be moving to. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we're docu most of us are documentary filmmakers. Many of us are long form documentary filmmakers. Mm -hmm. The platform is probably agnostic to long form. So if you were speaking to documentary filmmakers. What are your immediate, what's your knowledge of the immediate youth that you're dealing with? Are they watching long form? Are, is long form being repurposed on these platforms? Or do you have to make completely new content for much shorter, um, you know, rather than deep dive, um, shallow dive material? I mean, I can't say that they're not watching long form. They are watching long form. If I look at, and it doesn't necessarily mean 
you know, in terms of like documentaries. I'm just talking about like just content. If I have, a, I'm watching a Nigerian film, which I was watching on a bus the other day, and it's part one and part two, um, <laughs> and it's all like two hours, you know. So they they have <laughs> they, they, there's interest there, right? You know, I don't think it's like a time factor, but more of like what's the, what it is that you're presenting, fiction, you know. Right? And that 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 was fiction, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yes, it was. Um, and so it's it's you know it's finding that story or finding that interest, you know, what are they interested in actually that they find that it's worth their while to sit for two hours, if they can sit for two hour um four hours, part one, part two of a Nigerian <laughs> film, uh, of a Tanzanian film as well, like they are the same kind of formats. Um but in terms of like, you know, getting them to be interested in like you know, the, the factual kind of stuff, um, you know, my my experience has been that, you know, if you go beyond three minutes. In fact, three minutes is very long. Um, sure. It is very long. Like, you know, one of the first things that we, you know, I was teaching some of my VJs, uh, video journalists, to do was the first three seconds of your shot, of, of your of your video should be like the the climax. Like, I should see that person get shot, boom, and then now explain to me what happened. Um, because literally when they're put, when they're, you know, you're competing for attention, you're competing for all of their attention. And, you know, when they're scrolling on their phones, literally this is the emotion all the time, right? Mm -hmm. If I go like this and I don't see that first image that will hit me that's like, you know, a person with half a face and, you know, and I, don't, I don't know, whatever it is that's like really stark or that text that says something really catchy, then trust, they will just do this. They'll just swipe you away, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, we'd say, like, st start strong, end strong, and whatever in the middle they can live through, you know. Um, I mean, if you, if they really can, yeah. But if we're talking about vice, right, yes. a lot of those duckies are like eight minutes, ten minutes mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. They're not deep. I mean, if they're not... Uh, some of them are. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and vice is moving into Africa now, too, because I, I think it sees a, a large youth, youth market there. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's nothing really that much, you know, feature documentary of an hour and a half is unlikely to sit there and, and really read to a youth audience. But I, but I don't think, you know, like the, the thing is when you say it's not deep, I mean, I feel like that's relative. And, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> relative, yeah. Because I don't think um, time dictates what meaning, yes. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I can be as touched. Because what? So what do you want? Do you want them to get the story, or do you want them to sit through, sit yeah. through the lecture? You know, <laughs> do you want them to walk away feeling like yes, I want to change the world, or do you want to feel like you have been heard, and all you know the aspects of your story has been heard, and then you feel like, okay, I'm letting it out. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, like this is something that you know the new technology or internet has taught us is now we're not giving, we, we as content producers are not dictating what they watch. They're dictating what they want to watch, right? Because they're going like, no, I don't feel like that. I'm not going to like that page. I'm going to like this one. And then we're, they're creating like clusters for themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so um, if you're not um, engaging in that and you're not observing that and saying, okay, how can that work for me and my long format, um, the, uh, my long format content, then, you know, you, 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 you maybe will feel that way that you know we're losing or documentary is dead or something like that, which I do not think so at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, you can you can service all we can service all of these audiences by um, optimizing your content for all of those platforms. So repurposing, yeah. yeah. In a sense. And I, I say optimizing. Okay. I don't like saying repurposing because repurpose um, is what's happening now, and it's not um, with the platforms in mind. It's not mm. um, platform mm. specific. Mm. Yes. So from initiation, you're saying optimizing. Yes. Yes. From initiation, it's okay. And this is and this is something like even like with um, working. For example, I was you know doing TV and things like that. We would go to a place, and you know your pieces. You know, maybe it's a documentary piece that you're doing, or or even so just a news piece or whatever. But as you're going into the the field, you're thinking, what's my what's my what's my what's my opening shot for that mobile for uh, what's my what's my catch line what's my hashtag for this what's what's going to happen or that's going to give me um, this what's my uh, should i make maybe we should make an insta story out of this maybe we should make a snapchat video just out of this and then so that we can you know create that and put it up, and put it up there you know mm. maybe we can make graphics that will are vertical a vertical um, formatted um, that will that will um, guide um, 
the audience on this part of the scene of the story, you know? Mm. Um, so that still, in one way or another, your story is getting out, is out mm. there and they're, and, they're, and they're connecting with your story, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, park that theme there for a second and ask us to come back, because I just, I think the other theme with, where we're kind of dealing with is um, wearing a lot of different hats, right? I think finding new audiences for our stories, um, optimizing, our documentaries so that they can fit on different platforms. Um, and then on, on an, uh, sort of the, the other three panelists, I think, talk to wearing many different hats. Yeah. And one of the things that is difficult, I think, say for, for Enver, is that reality TV tends to take slots away from documentaries. So, I mean, how do you... <laughs> <laughs> so on the one hand, you know, you're getting fed by the system that's defeating the other, yeah. the passion. <laughs> so, so just how culturally do you find yourself putting on these different hats? Or... Well, well, thankfully, I'm not the, the programmer, but, you know, the, those are the guys that make those decisions. But um, for me, at the end, it's just about the bottom line, is how do I survive? And, and that's the way I'm surviving at the moment, is, is by doing reality shows. I mean, as hard as it might seem to, to some of you, um, for, you know, for me, that's how, how I pay the bills. That's how I send my kid to school. I mean, the um, other argument could be that more people are watching factual programming, and although it might be not be as a deep dive in sociology, it's an interesting sociological, yeah. you know, mirror in a sense, mm -hmm. and it could be breeding people to factual programming. So it's not all doom and gloom. No, no. I mean, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I'm still crafting a story there. Um, as the content producer, you, you, everyone has to have a beginning, middle, and an end. So. So we spend a lot of time crafting the story of each individual contestant. So um, it's not just pure reality. Yeah, and yeah. the tools that you use crossing those genres for each of them, right? I mean, in your documentary, it also seems that there are dramatic devices that you might use in both those genres. So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think so. They, they sort of mutually exclusive in terms of the craft. Um, I mean, I'm developing my craft all the time, so I'm learning all the time. So I, I, I find new ways and new methods to incorporate, um, you know, either either way, either genre. Yeah. Okay, I think we should do a lot of hands. So let's open it up to the panel, unless you guys want to offer anything more. Okay, should we start? at the back and then come to Peter and then um, Hello there, thank you very much for sharing all your experiences um, I think we mainly saw TV uh, factual based uh, documentaries today uh, apart from one of the examples I guess and um, is it mainly focusing on South Africa, uh, these projects, or uh, can we open it up to other countries in uh, Africa, in that sense? And um, the portrait was a bit like, oh, you have to self-finance these things or get the support of a TV show. So is there any other, uh, you know, festivals or, you know, uh, programs that you can suggest and, you know... Um, I don't know, that's the end of my question, really. Tess, do you want to handle that from the DFA? <laughs> yeah, I suppose um, from the DFA... Well, oh, and the panel, sorry. Um, so the DFA is the, the, the documentary body that, uh, you know, uh, looks after the, uh, the documentary filmmakers in South Africa. But I think the, the big opportunity is working with South Africans is that we have very good uh, tax incentives, um, which you can obviously exploit working with a South African filmmaker. And I think there's also lots of opportunities to find and explore stories that can work, um, you know, South African-based stories that can work internationally as well. So I think, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities in that sense. And obviously with our colonial histories, we have good, you know, there's just lots of interesting stories that you could explore 
Um, we've got uh, co-production treaties with the Dutch, the English, um, who is it? The French, the French, the Irish, the Canadians. So, you know, so, and, and the Brazilians as well, I think, recently. So there's a whole lot of uh, formal co-production treaties, which are, you know, quite um, lucrative to exploit in terms of making films. So. What's that? Is Germany? Germany, Mark. Germany signed, right? Is Germany? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got Germany as well. Yeah. Okay. So there's local ways that you can get that funding access to work in a co-production in South Africa. But with this, this forum is open. I mean, if you were saying, is this forum open to any producers in Africa? Yes. I'm, I wasn't completely clear of your question. Yeah. So, who's that? Riyad? Hi, Riyad. Hi. I think the... I mean, firstly, uh, South Africa is one of the few African countries where you have uh, some sort of TV industry which has historically worked and attempted to nurture documentary film. Uh, that is less and less so over the last few years, given the economic crisis and other intervening factors. But, um, and that's doesn't exist elsewhere in Africa, really. Uh, that level of institutional support from the, you know, the economic incentives to the National Film and Video oh, Foundation. Yeah, so the, the, the reality is that you know, most African filmmakers in this room from South Africa, because parts of our state are still functioning pretty well in terms of the support. So, but that's not to say there's a great no, group of filmmakers right. in East Africa who are the uh, Just Do It generation doing some great stuff in Kenya and Tanzania. Andy's working with a number of those. Some of them uh, are in the room. Um, West Africa, it's beginning to happen. Um, through Nollywood, we're seeing the emergence of, of a documentary tradition which is starting to produce some interesting stuff. And we know the fine work that's coming out of North Africa. But much of that, you know, West and North Africa is dependent on the... European funds and European broadcasters, uh, so we're making stories for other countries rather than for our own people, and that's the, the big challenge. There's a question up here. Are you done? Okay. Um, Oliswa, did you want to respond and then to learn? Well, we have different Africans here, so it's very inspirational. But actually, one of the things that we are looking at, uh, South Africa already has an MOU with Kenya, South Africa is on the verge of actually signing a treaty with Tunisia, and we are engaging Zimbabwe. So we are actually looking at creating uh, co-productions and MOUs with those countries to see how we can work with them, even though, as Rihad rightfully said, that those countries don't actually have very strong institutions in terms of supporting the filmmakers. But the fact that we've got an MOU with Kenya, you know, and now we are having a lot of Nigerian uh, co-working with South Africa, people like Miki Dube. He's just done a brilliant film with um, like a co-production with Nigeria. So I am quite optimistic about the fact that, you know, we will be working with African filmmakers. So I'm glad some of the background or the specific circumstances of South Africa has been, have been voiced because I think that's very important. It's a very unique situation. Mm. In relation to that, I would just say, like to say that it has always been difficult to find funds for documentaries. I don't know a time when it's been difficult, when it's been easy. No. South Africa had had various advantages, institutional structure, and various initiatives in the post-apartheid situation which relative to now might look like there's some kind of re retraction and diminishing. But that's a very specific South African situation. If you look at Britain, you look at Europe, the funds have always been precarious. Few venues, few up accesses. If you were if working in the British film industry in the 1980s, it would probably be Channel 4, ZDF perhaps. Not much more than that. The BBC made their own stuff. Okay, so uh, what I'm suggesting here is a sort of historical perspective and relative perspective and really expressing what is unique and important about the South African experience since 1990, 
1994. Mm. The second thing I'd like to say is, when you look at Tanzania, I don't know how it sounded to the Tanzanian um, filmmaker when you hear about co-production treaties, because in Tanzania that doesn't mean anything. Nobody's heard about that, it doesn't exist, right? What we are trying to do is develop a, a, a documentary awareness and tradition in a culture, a media culture, where, for example, documentary has been linked to journalism. And here you talk about, in a media expanding situation, the irony of survivals fighting, taking up slots from documents. That's crazy. You know, we, are in ex we have the widest reach of media um, landscapes. Now you can have buy a camera, but where do you put your, your product and how do you eat from your product, okay? Now these are the questions that all documentary filmmakers are facing in different ways in Africa. Let's talk about Africa in particular. I just want to say one thing more about the situation relative to South Africa because this worrying trend about the mobile phone and I say it's worrying because Africa still has some of the highest mobile connectivity rates in the world. Poor people are creating millionaires. Mohammed Amin, no, not Mohammed Amin, Mohammed Ibrahim is one of them. He now gives his money away to retired presidents, among other things. Okay, that's the irony of it. He made his money out of the mobile phone industry. Okay, so now we have this convergence between the mobile phone and audiovisual production. That's a paradox where we don't have regular electricity. That's a paradox where people are not being trained critically in documentary filmmaking. There's no valid film schools outside of South Africa, really. Where critical thinking, apart from the skills which you can learn by reading the manual, which is what most people do, are being taught and engaged. So this economy is problematic. In Tanzania, as I'm sure you know, the government has just passed legislation to tax social media. A, a, a license... I'll explain that a little bit later, but go ahead. To, 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 people have to have a license to blog, literally, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? And it's exorbitant. Mm -hmm. The idea is governments are pushing back on the freedom which the digital landscape um, provides. So I just wanted the panel, if they could address those issues in a way, how they affect what you might be aspiring to, whether in South Africa or beyond. So I just wanted to speak to the diminishing funds for documentary in South Africa. Um, I think one of the things that happened since 1994 is that we had dedicated documentary slots on the public broadcaster and uh, we were commissioning 52 documentaries a year. Some of those were foreign licensed, but many of them were locally sourced. Um, those, as a result of the, the state interference with public broadcasting, there, was, there has been less documentaries commissioned and paid for, and filmmakers have found themselves looking elsewhere for funding. Um, in fact, the dedicated slots are slowly coming back but they have been filmed by, uh, filled by formatted documentaries, so 13-part formatted series rather than creative documentary. Um, the National Film and Video Foundation has not been one of the best supporters of documentaries and don't give enough financing, as the financing is really spent on global travel and marketing rather than actual production. So in, in that, there's a, there have been diminishing funds available for documentary filmmakers. Then on, the, on Storyville, as an example in the UK, one of the reasons that Nick um, su suggested that he might leave was the fact that the kind of nationalist um, emergence of nationalism in a, in a lot of the territories of which he was working with, in Poland, in, in Europe, in, were focused on local stories and local nationalism rather than foreign um, financing. And that was one of the things that he was finding difficult to fight for funding to license foreign interest documentaries. And then speaking to the European um, Documentary Network, they said that public broadcasting has never been in more of a crisis as it is now because public broadcasting is having its money taken away to support immigration concerns, security concerns, 
and that the public broadcasting, in particular where that source of funding for documentary filmmakers is, is no longer available. They're having to cut their budgets. So there's no, that they are now creating a, a sort of emergency paper on how to defend public broadcasting and documentary in particular. So it seems like that is also, and then you have, you know, you have big film, like Netflix for an example, but it's that one big film. It's not a whole lot of different documentary films that are being um, bought. But even then your initial development is producer and director driven, it's not development funding. So that's part of where, you know, thinking about the crisis that documentary, particularly public broadcasting funding is, is in crisis. I think, I think we're in South Africa probably on a journey upward, we hope, because there have been a lot of shifts in the last um, few months that are very progressive. So I think we have a lot to hope for. But at the same time, the broadcaster has uh, advertorial spend as part of its makeup of its finances, and so there's going to be commercial imperatives on documentary. So. But so, sorry, you wanted to speak to. Yeah, I just wanted to just clarify on the on, on what you're talking about in, in Tanzania. So um, that law or that presentation, uh, there was an injunction against it. So it's not it's not it's not valid. It's just hanging in the air right now. But the thing is, was the clarification was that. So the, the online space of Tanzania is quite unique. Uh, um, uh, people before Facebook came along, people would use blogspot.com and start bl not blogging, but have like picture blogs or something of like, and so what people came up with was someone would come and uh, let's go, go to an, in a parliament event or a government event or something like that, post pictures, and they'd get a lot of like views. And then of course advertisers came on board. And so now you have big blogspot.com kind of like people, uh, individuals, Isami Chuzi, like very big names that when you go like three pages, are just ads, right? And then uh, a lot of online TV started coming up through those platforms. And so the government got scared on lack of understanding of what was going on, where are we making money from this? And so they decided very wisely, um, wisely <laughs> to, 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 to bring that tax about. However, now they've clarified that it doesn't touch uh, your Facebook post or if you do an Instagram blog or whatever, it doesn't touch any of those big social media brands. Um, if you have a website that's your website as a company or whatever, it doesn't touch the content that you make for that website. Um, and we're still in deliberation with them because I think, as you were saying about the mobile space, it's, there's a big um, worry around it, but I think mostly it's just a lack of understanding about how, how, that platform, how we're using that platform. Yeah. Is there any, we could take one, can we take two more questions? Sorry, I stole a mic. Um, thank you for a really interesting panel. And it's actually something to, pick, something to pick up on what this gentleman was saying. Um, you were talking about um, uh, mob using mobiles as a new broadcasting platform and um, gaining new audiences and younger audiences. But it was what this gentleman was saying about how South Africa in particular has dis disproportionately expensive data compared to anywhere in the world, it seems to me, anyway. And it's... In doing that, although you're gaining new audiences, are you ever concerned in some ways that you're losing audiences as well? Because obviously there's a certain percentage of the population that just cannot afford to watch things on their mobile phone. A, a very large percentage, presumably, of the population that won't be able to access those, that content. Sure, are you going to take... Yeah, so, you know, and that's why whenever I was speaking, I always say Tanzania, Tanzania, because Africa is not homogeneous, so I will not speak um, for areas. The issue, but then the, the issues are all the same, uh, not all the same, but roughly the same. Uh, data is an issue. Um, the infrastructure around the, uh, the mobile ecosystem is also an issue. But you, you'll find that in those countries where, or at least in Kenya and in Tanzania, let me say, where they realize that uh, there's like high competition for between telecommunication companies. They realize that more people want to watch videos, um, whether it's via WhatsApp or things like that. They create, they have created now special bundles where you can, you buy for, you know, yeah, data is really expensive in South Africa because I remember it was like one, 100 rand for, mm. which is like what, $10, $1, something yeah. like that. Um, 
for for a GB. And for me, a GB is nothing. Like um, a GB is nothing. I, I deal with 15 GB. 15. It's much more expensive. Yeah, it's insanity. It's, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. How much in dollars is a rand? Let me just like. Uh, 15. 15. 12. Right. So so. That mathematics I can't do very fast. Okay, yeah. but but, the, yeah. but for example, um, um, for myself, um, if I use ten ten dollars, ten dollars need like that. Yes, so t for ten dollars, I I have I have a bundle for um, about a month, you know, and that's like thirty GB, and I, I like I can I can go through that like that. <laughs> Mind you, yeah. I can go through it like that, right? Just watching stuff. Yeah, uh, you're all envious of me. But yeah. come Tanzania, we'll, we'll have fun. Um, so there's countries where the, those, uh, that ecosystem is, is uh, they're realizing that, mind you, the people, first of all, uh, because of the demographics of the people, they're like, you know, lower the costs, you know, create situations where we can, you can, even we have video-specific bundles that you that you that you can acquire as well. So what if what if I as a content maker come and which is something I think Citizen TV in Kenya have have done now. I as a content maker realize this and say let me partner with a telecommunications company. So Citizen TV in Kenya has done that. Uh, let me create this. Um, is it an app or something like that? I don't know if it's an app. I'm not mm. sure. But they, they call it View Sasa. So you use your mobile money to buy this video-specific bundle to access these videos that you want, right? Mm. And because I'm a, I'm a TV station and I already create this content or whatever, you know, it's just a matter of like, oh, you have your favorite stars you watch every day, but now you can access them on your phone. Boom. Right? And, and so for me, it's not about losing audiences because the audience... I don't, I don't, they're growing, they're not, you're not losing, you're growing, you're just getting new ones, you're just getting yeah. a new type, new, a new type, them in yeah, ways. and you're reaching yeah. them differently, yeah. But uh, in terms of South Africa, I think it is um, complicated by very expensive data, mm -hmm. which is why we have such an opportunity for public broadcasting, because there's a very loyal audience sitting on all the public broadcast channels, which is why there's such a political fight over it, because it really reaches into the into the households of Southern Africa. But that will change. We've got a moment to make good documentaries on public broadcast. <laughs> okay, um, I just wanna close the panel. Everyone will be here. We have drinks at 4.30 on the roof of the Curzon. Please come. There are a lot of really interesting documentary filmmakers here with great projects. Please come and talk to us. I want to say thank you to the panelists for bringing their work and for um, entertaining us all. Thank you very much. Thank you.